Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Hope Talks. If this is your first time joining us, um, or if you've joined us before, if you joined us last month, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in and thank you for supporting Southside Center of Hope. Um, I'm going to take a minute just to let people get settled in, you know, um, see who's joining. If you are here with us today, please say hi, leave a comment, let us know where you're viewing from. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, my name is Catherine, Catherine Newman, and I am the Development and Communications Coordinator for Southside Center of Hope. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Southside Center of Hope is a nonprofit recovery home. Um, we're located on the south side of Chicago, and we exist to serve single women and women with children in Chicago who are experiencing homelessness um, and are in recovery from addiction. So um, again, I wanna say thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you're viewing, if you could please share this out, that would be amazing. We'd really appreciate that. We just wanna make sure that we can reach as many people as possible today and um, you know, every day. If you haven't already liked our Facebook page, please feel free to do that now. Um, you know, we are posting new content all the time, keeping everyone updated. Let's see. You know, we are, oops. See, I'm still trying to work out the kinks on this thing. <laughs> Live streaming was not my strong suit, but I like to learn something new every day. I'm trying to see who all has joined us yet, but I'm having trouble finding that information. So if you're here, again, thank you and welcome. Um, so, uh, again, please share this. If you're viewing, share it to your page, start a watch party. If you're viewing this after the fact, you're not watching it live, um, you can still share it. There's going to be some really valuable information here today. Um, and if you're not familiar with Hope Talks already, this is something new um, that we have just started doing. This is our second Hope Talk. And we are, our goal is to do this once a month every month on the third Monday. So you'll have that to look forward to. Um, and the purpose of Hope Talks is to introduce you, our viewers, our followers, our supporters, our alumni, um, whoever, however you may be, you know, connected with Southside Center of Hope. Our goal is to introduce you to community resources, but also to just have really important conversations on topics that impact our community. That could be our neighborhood, that could be our community, you know, more broadly, homeless women in Chicago, women with children um, struggling with addiction. Um, we really just want to, you know, have conversations um, with some of our partners about those topics. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. We're going to be having, um, and our, our special guest is gonna be James Burns. Um, and so he's gonna provide some really, really great information on um, healthcare, mental healthcare, equal access, unequal access, you know, what that really looks like here um, in Illinois and in Chicago specifically. So let's see if I can figure out how to use Facebook. I'm trying to see if anyone here is joining us. We'll give it about five more minutes and then we'll bring James on. So yeah, if you're viewing, let me know in the comments, um, you know, where you're joining us from. And also moving forward, if there's anything that you would like to see us talk about um, questions that you would like to have answered. I'm still, you know, getting used to the whole live streaming. So um, if I don't get to your questions today, 
please still leave them in the comments and, you know, me or James, um, we can find that information for you that you're looking for. And if there's any topics that you want us to cover um, this summer, in the fall, just let us know in the comments. Um, we love to hear from you guys, so. Okay. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about today's topic. Um, we are gonna be talking about, like I had mentioned, equal access. Um, and you know, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, there's so many people who struggle with access to specifically to addiction treatment and mental health care, which are kind of the realms that we work in, um, you know, with, with everything that's going on right now as well, um, the COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, some of the different things that we're seeing in our communities, um, resources that are kind of disappearing, um, we felt that now was a really good time to bring this up and um, to really highlight uh, work that we're doing, work that some of our partners are doing um, and maybe where those resources still could be found. So we know that there's a lot of issues facing our community today. Um, and like I said, you know, Hope Talks is gonna be very ongoing. It's, we're gonna try to keep it, you know, as relevant as possible. Um, so, like I said, if there's anything that you want us to talk about, let us know. Uh, we have a huge, huge, um, you know, network of partners that are kind of all moving independently, but all working together um, to make Chicago a better place. And so let us know, leave me a comment. Let me know what you want to hear about. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna get started soon. Just a couple more minutes to let people get on and settled. Um, thank you all for joining again. Please share this again, if you haven't heard me say that yet. Um, you know, this information is really important, but it's also important that it reaches people. Um, so if you can share it with your network, we would really appreciate that. Um, Okay, so I guess the last thing that I'll talk about while uh, we're in this little um, this little front end of the, the live stream is just who we're gonna be having here today. Um, our guest today is James Burns. He is currently the program director for the Kennedy Forum Illinois. Um, he also outside of that is the founder and president for the South Branch Park Advisory Council and in that role he acts as a liaison for um, the community and the Chicago Park District. Um, James is from Chicago. He lives on the south side and um, overall he's just very passionate about making Chicago a better city for people to live in. Um, inspires a lot of his work inspired him to, um, you know, work with the park district and, and you'll hear more about what he's doing with the Kennedy forum, um, to really bring that to fruition. So I think that, you know, without further delay, it might be time to bring James Burns from the Kennedy Forum, Illinois. I'm gonna go ahead and add him in here. Let's see if we can find him. Hi, James. Hey, how are you? I'm good, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Can you hear me all right? Um, yes. Okay, let me make sure it looks all right on Facebook because I don't really know. I'm still a little new at this, so. <laughs> sure, right. We're all uh, on this learning curve the last few months. Right, right. Okay, perfect. So it looks good. It looks good. We're good to go. Great. Okay, so welcome, James Burns from the Kennedy Forum, Illinois. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for being here. Really excited to participate in the conversation. Okay, awesome. So, um, I did, you know, we can call it 
whatever I keep the word filibuster keeps coming up. I've been, you know, just talking to our viewers for the last 10 minutes. I shared with them a little bit of information about you and about the Kennedy forum, but um, mm -hmm. to get started before we really get into this topic of equal access, um, I was hoping that you could just share a little bit of background for me. Um, what is the Kennedy forum? Uh, and, and what motivated Patrick Kennedy to found it? Sure. Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, good to be here and, and good to see you. You and I have exchanged many emails before, by the way, and I, this is the first time I'm seeing your face. So uh, yeah, yeah. Hooray, hooray for that. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the Kennedy Forum, our mission is to eliminate the stigma and discrimination against those living with mental health and substance use disorders. So. Um, Patrick Kennedy, uh, for those who don't know, is actually the son of Ted Kennedy, and um, that makes him the nephew of the late John F. Kennedy, and Patrick was actually a congressman in his own right from Rhode Island um, from uh, the mid-90s till 2010, and even though he had some success while uh, in the House of Representatives, he understood that if he wanted to reach his full potential, that he was going to have to leave Congress uh, and, and find his true self because Patrick is someone who lives with mental health and substance use disorders. So uh, he left Congress in 2010 and immediately uh, went about trying to um, work on his own mental health as well as his physical and spiritual health. And shortly after finding the best version of himself, he realized in true Kennedy fashion that there are a lot of people who live in darkness, who are uh, living with mental health and substance use disorders uh, in the closet, who don't have a voice, who don't have the capacity or the resources to push back against resources uh, that don't exist or against insurance companies or uh, can't single-handedly take down stigma. So he founded the Kennedy Forum. Uh, and <clears throat> since he founded the Kennedy Forum, uh, gosh, it's, uh, I guess, seven years ago now, um, we've been working to support policy uh, in cities, states, uh, and also on the federal level uh, in Illinois just a couple of years ago uh, where I do uh, all of my work. Um, we uh, passed the, the, the country's strongest parity uh, enforcement law, which basically states that your mental health has to be covered by your insurance company at the same rate as your, uh, your physical health. So um, that's a big component of, of what it is that we do with the Kennedy Forum is this policy piece, which is really important. But on parallel tracks with the policy piece, we also want to work on eliminating stigma. And we know that these things have to happen um, side by side. And we work to eliminate stigma by bringing people face to face, just like uh, this, this venue that we have right now, because the research shows that the most effective way to eliminate stigma or to change anybody's perception about mental health is to have a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody who's been there and done it. Um, now, I've, uh, I'm someone with 11 plus years of, of sobriety. Um, mental health has not only been important to me, James, but also to my immediate family. Uh, I have people who, who live with mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and I come from, um, sorry, I was going to make a joke there about being Irish Catholic. I'll let that one uh, alone. But um, I just, I think that it doesn't, mental health and substance use disorders really impacts everybody, right? So um, that doesn't make me unique. I think that if there is anything unique about me within the Kennedy Forum, um, it's just that we're, we're so forward about talking about it, right? That's in a really important piece uh, is that we can just come out and say, I'm not afraid of you understanding that, that I uh, have troubles controlling my alcohol um, and that there's a lot more that comes with it. But I am here to say that not only can you live with the mental health and or a substance use disorder, um, and you can live a really fulfilling uh, and, and happy life, right? It doesn't have to define you. Uh, so uh, that's kind of it. And in, in, uh, that's probably a little bit more than a nutshell, but uh, that's where we're at. Yeah. Well, I like that you brought up, you know, the stigma surrounding it, because that really is kind of the whole reason that we started doing these hope talks um, was to mm -hmm. just shed some light and, and, just show that, you know, we all go through these things and we all have these experiences and, um, you know, what's more important is getting the help you need, making the progress, moving forward. Um, so 
So I'm really glad you brought that up. And, and really the first question that I wanted to ask you was let's just, you know, kind of start from the, from the beginning and talk about challenges. What, what are some of the challenges that people face when it comes to accessing behavioral health and addiction treatment? You know, what are those barriers that we really need to work on breaking down first of all, before we can move forward? Yeah, first and foremost, it is that stigma piece. Um, it, it, you know, when I, I do work all across the city and even the state, um, what's interesting is as you meet different groups of people uh, who have um, their own identity, their own culture, something that you will hear is, well, in my culture, the stigma is so high. And it's, it's, not, um, it's not that they're proud necessarily, they're just saying, and we have uh, an AmeriCorps member um, who's with us right now. Uh, she's from the Northwest side and she's first generation Mexican-American. And she says that in her culture at home with her family or her extended family, the stigma is so high, right? And it, it, she can't imagine it being any higher anywhere else. And you can hear something of that. And I, I was making a joke about the, um, you know, the Irish Catholic American family that I come from. I can't imagine it being any higher in anybody else's family than it is in my own. And you can imagine how all these different groups of people feel similarly. Uh, and the way that I like to respond to that is regardless of who has the most amount of stigma within their home, within their culture, within their world, the fact is that if here is the level of uh, stigma that is allowable, which is zero, basically, we are all way up here, yeah. right? Um, and uh, regardless if, if it is, uh, feels insurmountable, I think that stigma is something that a lot of people feel is incredibly insurmountable if you don't talk to people like you or like me or the many, 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 I mean, there's so many other people out there uh, who have come out and shared their story. And the stigma piece, I also like to frame it in this way uh, that I find to be really helpful. It's just that mental health doesn't just have to be somebody who is an alcoholic or somebody who uh, lives with schizophrenia. Mental health is something that we all have, and it does not discriminate. And I often give this example, if we imagine mental health living on a continuum, and if you're living, uh, you know, imagine like a one to 10 scale, if you're living your dream life, that means that your mental health is at a 10, right? Everything is just going perfect for you. Uh, and it can be something uh, like the death of a family member, which can come rather suddenly, it could be a pandemic. Um, it could be the civil unrest that we've seen over the past few weeks. It could be a bad night's sleep. There are so many different things that can knock us back from that 10 on that mental health continuum to a nine, to a seven, to a five, whatever it is. You don't have to be someone with a serious mental illness or uh, a serious drinking problem uh, to, to have mental health. We all have it. So I think part of it is at least the way that I talk about it frequently and people seem to be incredibly receptive to is that um, it's not something that we should be afraid of. We have to accept it, right? Yeah. And once we understand that stigma is real and it's going to stop us from looking for any kind of care um, and that it is not just like the crazy person walking down the street, it's everybody. It's my three-year-old in the room next to me over here it's myself, it's you, it's, it's everybody watching. We all have mental health. And if we can just begin to understand that it is part of like the whole person, it's caring for the whole person, um, just like people know that exercise is important and sleep is important and dieting is important, your mental health is right there with all of those different pieces of the person. And so I'm also curious, um, you know, stigma is huge. We've talked about this and um, it's very clear, um, but some other challenges, I'm just wondering if you can shed some light on some other challenges, just because I know, you know, a little bit of the history of our own city of Chicago, um, you know, closing several public mental health facilities where, you know, the teachers have been fighting for a little bit more funding for counselors in schools and nurses in schools. Can you talk a little bit about that kind of just with, you know, actual you know, physical access and proximity and those kind of challenges that might exist as well. Yeah, sure. So that uh, certainly is a challenge that the city of Chicago faces. And I think that it's a challenge that you see all over the place. Um, and it is that 
big challenge about having access, like literally within your community. Uh, I know some people because of stigma, if we, you know, you said, what is that bottom line thing? What is that first barrier of stigma? Um, some people have even said to me just anecdotally that even if there was a facility in their community that they could walk to, um, the stigma of being seen walking into the facility mm -hmm. would stop them from going there, right? Yeah. So it is this incredibly complex challenge uh, that we, we all face. Um, and, you know, we often talk, when we do our trainings, we talk about like um, the community wellness, right? This, this idea that we can't just have these verticals of here is where our mental health is, this is where our education is. These things are intertwined, right? And yeah. um, it is not just the lack of uh, mental health facilities or clinics or resources, it is a lack of economic opportunity. It is a lack of security. It is a lack of housing. It is a lack of food. All of these things can contribute to mental health uh, and vice versa, right? Um, and I think that um, when you are dealing with a city of 3 million people like Chicago, those things tend to multiply on top of each other um, because mm -hmm. uh, you add that, that next layer and it, it is not a multiple of two. You're talking, it, it can become a multiple of 10. Um, so there are a lot of things that, that can layer on top of uh, the stigma and just like having the facility in your community. And so... I think we kind of touched on this, but I want to ask you directly um, mm -hmm. if you feel as though black and brown communities in Chicago, in Illinois, or, you know, even broadly, however you want to speak on this, but, you know, if they face these challenges more than others, or maybe if they face different challenges, if you could just talk about that specifically, since I know you're South side based, we're South side based. Um, so we really, we kind of want to dive into that as well. Yeah. Uh, so the short answer is yes, 100% uh, black and brown communities are um, more impacted by, um, I guess, mental health. But but again, I, I go back to this, like the the overlapping. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Um, because of different education, because of meeting household incomes in a community, because of lack of uh, opportunity, because of lack of uh, all these different things, then uh, naturally, um, sadly, uh, these communities are hit incredibly hard by these sorts of things. And then, you know, we talk about the, we've been doing this webinar around the pandemic since, you know, mid to late March, and it's seen an incredible response. So we've reached uh, over 4,300 people, I believe uh, our, our current number is uh, since that time. And it has had a great impact because all of a sudden people's understanding of like mental health, kind of to my point about it lives on the continuum, people's understanding of the impact of, of your mental health and being really um, having a lot of stress and, and maybe, um, you know, not taking as good a care of yourself as you need. We were there to kind of provide some tools and some, some guidelines for people to respond to the pandemic. And then, the murder of George Floyd happens and, um, you know, it, everybody, it seems, began pushing uh, in this, this direction of we absolutely need to see some sort of change. Uh, and what was interesting to me, there's two things here. One is that our pandemic webinar was so relatable to some of the aspects that we saw around George Floyd. Some of the things that we talk about in the webinar is stay off of social media, right? Like that's, you're not going to find the answers that you're looking for. Uh -huh. And instead it can be, it can stress you out. Um, you should of course find um, the news that you need to inform yourself and make sure you're, you're actually consuming the factual information. Um, and then there's some aspects around self-care, um, you know, making sure that you're, you're listening with compassion and empathy. If you're a white person like me speaking to another white person, if you're speaking to um, you know, another black person, whoever it is, we all need to demonstrate compassion and empathy during this time. So it was really interesting to see the overlap between uh, pandemic life, George Floyd unrest. Um, and then of course, these things hopefully will carry on post um, as these things occur. Um, but then the second piece here uh, is that when we, the Kennedy Forum responded to uh, what was happening specifically around uh, the murder of George Floyd was 
uh, we actually provided resources for people specific to uh, what they may be experiencing, whether it was trauma around witnessing the murder of George Floyd or trauma around um, other uh, videos of police brutality that have been shared. And those resources were specific to black and brown communities. And uh, we weren't the only ones, of course, there are a lot of people right. um, who were who were doing this because um, while we can talk about these big systemic things, um, you know, lack of mental health resources in communities or lack of uh, great schools or, you know, all these different things that like you uh, are believe necessary in like a, a thriving world. Um, you know, one of the things I think as recently as three weeks ago that um, wasn't as upfront was this idea that some people not only um, don't trust the police, but they're fearful of the police, mm -hmm. right? And um, so that is, um, at least for myself, um, that's, that's kind of a new idea that like this, this shouldn't be like the second or third layer of what we're considering here uh, as it relates to mental health. This should be uh, perhaps, you know, at the, the top yeah. of the list. And so the next thing I wanted to ask you was just, you know, how the Kennedy Forum is addressing those challenges um, which I know you had mentioned very specific, um, you know, current um, ways that you had been working. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's anything else you want to share, kind of more of your ongoing operations, I know right now is, you know, mm -hmm. we're kind of all just, you know, adapting constantly. But if you wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of just what your your overall um, method of operation is to getting closer and closer to everyone having access to quality care. What does that look like for you guys? Yeah, so uh, thanks for that. Um, I'm, I'll just say, uh, again, on a personal note, when I, I did a lot of reflection um, after uh, the murder of George Floyd and um, was thinking about not just from a personal perspective, but also a professional perspective. Um, and uh, I was happy to kind of come to terms with this idea that uh, the Kennedy Forum, uh, in specifically with the work we've been doing on Chicago's South Side over the past couple of years, uh, we are not the solution, but we are a part of the solution, um, which was um, really incredibly, uh, it was a blessing, right? And um, I think about what have we done with our, our time here in uh, the city of Chicago? Uh, and I just started in, in March of 16. And uh, in that time, uh, we launched a pilot project on Chicago's West Side, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, after a successful pilot project, which was intended just to bring mental health training sessions to community stakeholders on the West Side, we were out in uh, Austin and North Lawndale and East and West Garfield Park. Uh, I believe the number we reached was 583 community stakeholders. We worked with Jane Adams College of Social Work to uh, evaluate the people who participated in those trainings because we wanted to be sure if we were going to go to a neighborhood and provide a training that those trainings were actually having the type of impact that we wanted. Um, before any of this even started, as a matter of fact, uh, we brought together a group of community leaders, uh, elected officials and principals from local high schools uh, and uh, leaders of local CBOs just to say, we think we have an idea. We want to bring people some information just to try and lessen stigma um, and then provide them resources. What do you say? And they helped us to kind of um, create this pilot project. And uh, it was incredible. It was an incredible experience uh, to, to go through there and work with the, the folks in the communities out there. Uh, and uh, after uh, a, a very successful pilot project in 2017, we came to the South Side in 2018 and 2019, and now we're kind of doing it citywide. So um, in those three years, though, we reached over 2,200 community stakeholders. Um, and by communities, and, you know, we, we came to you guys and we did the training. I can't, was it last... Mm -hmm. um, last July or August. I, I'm sorry. I don't remember right off the top of my head. Yeah, me either. Uh, I was um, there though, but. <laughs> yeah, and, and I didn't, I didn't make it there that day. I, I, I can't remember which trainer we sent, but um, either way, uh, that was how we kind of uh, officially got um, to know each other. Um, but we, community stakeholders are people like you, right? And, and whether it is your staff or it is the clients that you serve, 
those are the people that we talk about when we talk about community stakeholders. Also, um, the leaders of churches and maybe their congregation too. Um, it could be uh, the the principals, the teachers, um, or the parents of the of the of the kids in, in local high schools or grammar schools, whatever it is. Uh, we have done trainings for all of these different types of audiences, and then uh, one of the the most fun, um, if I could call it fun, um, is like when we reach out to just like the communities and we um, put a flyer at the local park district or whatever it is. And we have a great listserv of folks and we blast out these, this information like, Hey, here's a training, come on by. And uh, it really took on, um, it really became an organic thing where um, on a couple of occasions, actually last summer, especially when we were really, uh, we hit our groove, um, somebody would send me an email being like, Hey, like you should be aware of this, but it was my email that was forwarded back to me. Right. It was like one person got the email, they forwarded it to somebody, they forwarded it to somebody and then boom back to me. Um, so, um, those park district trainings, those public trainings, it's just anybody, right. If you're a retiree and you want to, you want to know more because your grandson, or your granddaughter, or maybe just the people that, uh, you, you work with and, and, uh, live with, um, you just want more information. Um, that has been uh, really, really cool to witness. And um, our trainings, we have two types of trainings, basically. One is a mental health awareness training, which is um, something that anybody walking in off the street can attend and learn something. Uh, I've sat through at least dozens uh, of these trainings, the mental health awareness trainings, uh, and they're never exactly the same. The curriculum is the same, right? Like we hit the same notes, but because of the audience or because of yeah. the trainer, um, they can take on a different tenor. So that's that's the one that people really like because it's, it's short, um, it's bite-sized, uh, and you can come away feeling like you've really learned something that you can use. And then we have the mental health first aid training as well, uh, which is an eight-hour training uh, and much more in-depth. And typically people have some sort of experience in, um, in mental health or uh, in um, social work, something of that nature before they jump into the mental health first day training. But those are the two trainings that we, we currently have to offer um, to community stakeholders. And that's literally available uh, across the city. And, uh, you know, here through the end of 2020, uh, it's, an, it's an opportunity for anybody to get involved. And so are you, you might have mentioned this already and I missed mm-hmm. it. So I apologize if I'm having you repeat yourself. Um, but are you, are you doing them online right now? If somebody was interested in that, you know, they're watching right now and they think, oh, I want to, you know, maybe host a, a training. Could they do some sort of a watch party or something like that? Or, or is yeah. that kind of on hold? No, no, no. Um, actually, if you call it a watch party, that's a great idea. I don't know why I haven't thought of that. I just think you throw the word party in there. Anymore. and it can, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, like everybody, I mean, like we're sitting here right now uh, in response to uh, the coronavirus and we have conducted virtual trainings, um, and that's that's what we're doing. So, if people are interested uh, in bringing a training of this nature to their organization, and it doesn't matter, it, it can just be your family, right? I I, um, I hope that, that you have a big family at least, because we want to try and make sure that we have at least um, you know at least uh, twelve to fifteen people per training, uh, just to make sure that we're utilizing our resources correctly. But um, Anybody who is interested in uh, bringing one of these trainings to your organization, to your community, uh, we can do it. And we can do it as soon as um, July uh, right now. And we're working on scheduling trainings. And uh, there is a bit of a silver lining, um, although I I prefer to be in the spaces where people are. Um, The virtual trainings are a little bit easier for everybody to participate in, though. Um, So Mm -hmm. people can be, you know, they're just at home and there's, you don't have to commute, you don't have to worry about parking, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, making sure you got your coffee or whatever it is. So uh, in that respect, there's a a small upside of the virtual trainings because they're incredibly uh, accessible to anybody who has um, an internet connection. So um, anybody who uh, is interested in, in scheduling one, I would suggest you send me an email um, in my email. Is this okay that I'm, I can do this right now? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Cause <laughs> we actually have Allegra Andrews in the comments asking uh, oh, yeah. you know, how she can attend a mental health training. So let's just go ahead and give it to them. Great. So if you just send me an email, this is the easiest way to do it. We're a small shop and um, I, I do a little bit of everything. My email is James, my first name, J-A-M-E-S, at the 
kennedyforum.org. And let me know. Whatever it is that you want, just let me know. And I'll, I'll field that request. And whether you personally are interested in, in just attending one of these trainings that are available, uh, we try to send out uh, available trainings for the universe to participate in uh, fairly regularly. But also, if you're interested in uh, scheduling a training for your specific organization or group, uh, we can do that too. So whichever way you're interested, drop me a line. We'll make it happen. Perfect. Thank you. And sure. thank you Allegra, for asking for that information. We want to make sure everyone can get connected with those trainings. Um, so let's see, what is next on my list of questions for you today? Oh, something I saw on your website. Yeah. Um, it stated on your website, we will revolutionize the way mental health care is delivered in America and create a future where diagnosis and treatment cover the body and brain. Um, so I wanted to just talk about that a little bit. You know, what's the correlation between body and brain? Why is that important? You know, especially when it comes to treatment, why do we have to talk about both? Yeah. So there's a great quote that Patrick Kennedy likes to use, and I really like it. Uh, and it is, the brain is part of the body. Unfortunately, society and other structures within society do not treat the brain as part of the body. Um, back to my example about parity, um, mental health parity, which is, a, you know, it's a huge piece of, of our work is focused on bringing mental health up uh, to the same level as physical health when it comes to uh, the coverage that you receive from your insurance. Uh, so uh, just a quick example, if you uh, go to um, your psychiatrist and it costs X amount of money um, and um, then you need to go and get medication and that's going to cost you X amount of money and that claim is put in by the doctor, uh, by the psychiatrist to your insurance provider and then your insurance provider says, nope, I'm sorry, we're not going to cover that. Now, even though you have um, seemingly come to grips with the fact that you do need some professional help, which I think we all do, um, mm -hmm. you've, you've overcome that stigma and you are going to take that huge step of, of being vulnerable. Um, and then you say, okay, I need to now uh, take some medication. This is all good. You've gone so far as a person to try and receive uh, some support. And then um, rather than your insurance covering it, uh, you're stuck with a $400 bill, let's say, right? Um, and I'm just making these numbers up to, to illustrate. Uh, right. And, you know, who can afford that? And are, is that person likely to continue? And chances are they're not. Uh, and, and that's where, uh, um, that's a big piece of, of the parity work is we want to be sure that everybody has the access that they need. Uh, and uh -huh. uh, making sure that your insurance is covering it, just like the pre-existing conditions, for example, um, that we saw passed uh, with uh, Obamacare, right? Um, if you had a pre-existing condition, you couldn't get coverage for it. And then what are the odds that you're going to get that pre-existing condition fixed? Incredibly small. Uh, so uh, that's, that's our work to try. And, um, you know, we revolutionize the way mental health care is delivered in America, um, you know, that's, that's like really uh, fancy, but um, we think that what we're talking about here, when we are discriminating against people who have mental health and substance use disorders, that it's a civil right, that just because you have an illness of the brain, imagine if we said to somebody with cancer, sorry, you can't get that chemo. Mm -hmm. It just, it wouldn't happen. I mean, people would be yeah. screaming from the mountaintops if if that were to happen today's day and age. And and unfortunately, um, you know, we, we see some of that in, in the mental health uh, field. So um, we just need to understand that the brain is just like any other part of our body, right? It's just like a heart. Um, it's just like a kidney or, or, or our skin or our eyes. Um, we need to take care of our brain the same as we would for anything else. Yeah. And I think it really goes back to that, you know, what we were talking about first and foremost, the stigma, you know, we need to, yeah. we need to kind of disassociate or forget that behavioral health doesn't mean that there's something wrong with your brain. 
you know, that, that negative connotation that always comes with it. And that kind of might be why people don't tend to fight for that access like they should, like they would with cancer or yeah. you know, some other chronic illness. Yeah. Um, and that brings me really well to the last question that I, I wanted to ask you today, um, which, you know, is kind of not so much focused on mental health. I want to, you know, talk specifically about addiction um, cause that's such an important piece for us. Mm -hmm. um, we see behavioral health and addiction overlapping, you know, sure. yep. quite yep. a bit. Yep. Um, so you know, our executive director, her name is Yasa Hagood, mm -hmm. um, and she works really hard to spread awareness about the fact that addiction is not a choice, um, to, you know, impress on people to look at it as a disease, just like you would any other chronic illness. Yes. And, and we, and we go the same route with mental health too. You really need to look at it as a disease and, and not as something that people can manage themselves at home or, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just would like to hear your thoughts on that topic, you know, just specifically, you know, with addiction, why should we treat addiction as any other chronic illness? Yes. Uh, so the shortest answer I can give is that addiction is a symptom often, right? Um, yes. I'll, I'll speak from, and I mean, you probably actually know more about this. I will only speak from, you know, I'm not a clinician, uh, mm -hmm. but I'll just, I'll just speak from my personal experience. Um, for me. I uh, look for answers in um, a bottle of booze, right? That's like the cliche thing that people might say, I'm looking for the answers at the bottom of the bottle of booze. Um, but as soon as I um, reached my bottom, if you will, and it was a pretty, it was a deep bottom, uh, as they would say uh, in uh, recovery, uh -huh. I pretty quickly realized that I was drinking because it was an, a way to ease what was going on inside, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of that was, uh, maybe it was a sense of hopelessness or despair. Um, clinically speaking, um, definitely depression. I know that uh, just is self-diagnosis, but I, I definitely had moments where I think my brain went uh, to another place, you know, where I don't, I didn't feel like I was actually in my body. I was watching myself do things. Um, and um, the drinking was a way to try and get through it. It was accessible. It's really cheap. Um, it is socially acceptable for people to, to drink as well. Um, and I, I took that to a degree that uh, nobody would agree was, was healthy. Um, but the healthiest thing that I did once I, uh, gained, um, some sobriety was I went and I saw a therapist two times a week for probably about two years, um, because I understood that there was, uh, there were some, uh, some things that were going on inside of me that I was unable to, or unwilling to look at and do some, some examination. So, um, that does not mean that I'm going to go back and, you know, have a beer anytime soon. Um, because I do feel that I worked out a lot of those challenges that I was facing, but, um, uh, addiction, um, it's a quick fix, right. Uh, and, uh, once you in the brain, you know, there are chemicals in the brain too, right. It's really, really powerful. Uh, and once people, um, find a way to maybe reach that, euphoric high or find that that peaceful numbness maybe that comes with whatever whatever it is that you're doing whatever it is that you're you're hooked on um all the brain wants is to go back to that right and the moment you come out of your stupor or whatever it is and again i'm just speaking from my own experience mm -hmm. when i would come out of that i'd be like oh my gosh and i would say this but also i you know in my, my head it was uh, my brain was actually working to try and get back to that very state because it was less painful there, right? There was, um, there was less awareness. So um, again, mostly from my perspective, but I think that just talking to other people that you see a lot of that as well is that your, your addiction, your, your drug of choice uh, is really just a way to cover up, um, you know, some of the, the things that uh, you guys see overlapping in your work. Great. And thank you so much for sharing that. I know, you know, 
uh, part of removing the stigma is, it is being willing to share our own recovery stories. So um, I, I just really want to thank you for, for being willing to share yours. Sure, of course. So, I mean, that really is uh, the extent of everything that I wanted to ask you about today. I do want to give you an opportunity, um, if there's anything else that you'd like to share, a closing statement, sentiment, any, you know, sure. anything uh, about the Kennedy Forum, not to put you on the spot, but yeah, no, 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 that's fine. Give you a chance to say goodbye and, and wrap up. Sure. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, just thank you for, for the opportunity and for the invite and for um, you know, being good partners of ours and uh, allowing us to speak to your community as well. Uh, I think that the more we can collaborate specifically in this space, right? The more that we can work together, the more people we can reach and the greater impact that we're going to have. Um, and I think that this is a perfect example of that. Um, you know, I imagine that we're reaching people today that we, we definitely weren't reaching uh, yesterday, right? So, um, that's incredible um, and really grateful for that opportunity. And then uh, I think uh, kind of taking a step back from that and, and looking at it from the 30,000 foot view, uh, I, I go back to a thing that I touched on earlier. Um, you know, how do we work through this really difficult time? And it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, um, what your perspective is. Uh, I think that uh, the number one uh, piece of advice. And people have asked me this uh, on a handful of occasions, like, what is your advice? What, what does the Kennedy form say uh, in response to, to everything that's happening? Uh, and uh, it's a little bit, I joke that it's like scary that people are asking me for advice. Um, but, um, you know, the, if we can be compassionate and have empathy for people right now, that goes an incredibly long way. Uh, and be, you can be vulnerable too. Um, and um, if we can do that, that's incredibly powerful. Uh, and then of course, make sure that you're taking care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, mm -hmm. then you can't take care of your family or your community. So uh, taking care of yourself is making sure that you are physically, spiritually, and mentally uh, whole. And if, if anything, if either of those, any of those three components of self are not right, then you need to do everything in your power to make them right. Because uh, without uh, any of those three things, then nothing else is going to work. So um, just remember that mental health is, is just like any other aspect of who you are. Uh, and we need to, to treat it with such priority. Um, that was a little bit uh, uh, somber, but um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Drop me a line. Um, I hope uh, I also say that I'm a Chicagoan. Just if, in, in case anybody has any doubts, there's a poster of uh, Michael Jordan frames. I told my my wife I bought a piece of art for the house, and she was like, "What?" And then this came, <laughs> and there was like some mixed some mixed feelings. Um, and I also I have that might be a stretch, but I <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Uh, so, anyways. Um, Thanks so much for the opportunity course, and yeah, uh, look thank you for joining us and, and thank you for always being such a great partner. Look forward to continuing, continuing the fight for equal access. That's right. That's right. Thanks again. All right. Have a nice day. Thanks. You too. Okay. Let's see. Well, and I'll say thank you to everyone for joining us, um, you know, for hope talks um, again, we do this the third Monday of every month. So check back, share the video, uh, leave us some comments if there's anything that you would like to see us talk about. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Everyone have a great week.